Hopefully. Hopefully this will work. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for supporting us with your presence uh, or joining us as a member. We really appreciate it. You know, we're a student society, so any support is much appreciated. Uh, yeah, so welcome to the first committee talk of the year. My name's Sophia, uh, and hopefully I can present what I think is my sort of version of an introduction to photography and composition and also focus what we do, what we hope to offer you as a society. I don't want to go too much into the sort of obvious cliches of, well, photo means light in Greek and graphy is what study or, or I don't know, science, whatever. I'd rather talk about the different sort of meanings to photography that can come across to different people um, and how photography can sort of bring about certain things that perhaps aren't possible with other mediums of art. So to me, there's kind of two sides of this. One is kind of the glamorous side of photography that everyone sort of seems to be at the forefront of, you know, say the media, you know, the magazines and so on. It's the beautification of reality or the exaggeration of reality. But undeniably, there's also a sense of um, reality, you know, the truth. Because obviously, as opposed to, say, painting, where everything's coming from the figment of the imagination of the painter, uh, photography always has a kind of sense of documentary, isn't it? It's always, these things have happened. So that element of truth that can evoke different kinds of emotions within us, perhaps, um, I mean, that's a photo of Robert Kennedy's assassination, for example. It's very, very, uh, uh, very evocative. Uh, so emotions can, from photography, can range from, you know, the dramatic. So they can evoke uh, emotions such as shock, you know, dark emotions like sadness and grief and anger, uh, trauma or sympathy even. And on the other end of the spectrum, you can have humour. So, you know, joy and laughter. So I'm sure there's many times where we've seen photographs that made us sort of laugh or smirk at least, and other times the photographs have made us sort of wince and cringe and we think we feel almost repulsed by them. So they, even though it's not a painting as such, and it's more real life, they still evoke very strong responses within us, I think. Um, and sometimes those emotions are not very clear. Um, sometimes what I think photography allows us to do is actually allows us our imaginations to wander sometimes. So in this case, for example, is a, this is an actress called Joan Fontaine, and she won the Best Actress Oscar in 1942. Basically, you can see she's staring, hopefully, um, on the right-hand side of the, the Oscar statuette on the, on the table. So this is just after she's won it. But you can see her expression. She's, she hasn't got like, a trace of joy on her face, even though this is probably the biggest professional achievement she'll ever have in her life. But what you see instead, you see sort of pensiveness or thoughtfulness, maybe even melancholy. It's almost like she's pondering her future or the pressures that maybe perhaps the award will give her. So it's very different to what you might expect. She's had some time to think about it. Whereas on the other side, you see an everyday woman. She's in the doctor's office and she's kind of, I think the, I can't, I can't remember what the story is. Either she's le le just learned that she's pregnant or she's been deaf all her life and she's just had a cochlear implant and she's been able to hear for the first time. It's one of those two. I can't remember, quite remember which. But either way, it's a significant joy in her life. She's just Obviously, she's just realised it. So there's an immediacy to this photo that there isn't with the actress photo, but there's, <laughs> even though there's two different kinds of sort of joys that they're experiencing, one is much more obvious than the other. And despite achieving you know, an Oscar award, uh, there's no joy that's obvious in that person's face. But basically what I'm trying to put across is, is that uh, some things are more obvious and upfront, some things are more open to your imagination. You can kind of look at it, and as the more you look at it, the more you kind of, um, the more different emotions that come across to you perhaps. Sometimes photography is more about, obviously a lot of photography relies on technology at the end of the day. You know, uh, in some ways you're constrained by it. But uh, sometimes you can break boundaries as well through technology that you're, you were initially were restrained by. So for example, uh, this photographer used a stroboscopic light technique. So it's basically long exposures. On the left, he, he used a long exposure with a stroboscopic light, so a strobe, you know, continuously flashing light to capture Gene Kelly, who's a famous dancer back then. And on the right, you see Pablo Picasso, and he's using a strobe pen to draw light over a long exposure. So basically, sometimes technological breakthroughs can kind of extend how you, the kind of art that you can create and the kind of aesthetics that can be possible. And sometimes the format of how you, what you choose, it, it, although it's all photography, there's so many different textures that are possible. And even with the same subject, they can create completely different looks and feelings or vibes. So on the left, you've got, you know, they're both mountain ranges, but on the left is 
what's, what must be a digital very digital image is very perfectly crystal clear and sharp and might seem quite refreshing and awe inspiring but on the right there's you know a lot of grain and that might uh, evoke more of the ruggedness of the mountains instead so you know it's up to you. it's no right or wrong it might be a preference we might prefer one more than the other um, but that just goes to show there's a range of palettes available even within photography it doesn't have to be significant events or people that are sort of captured they can be the mundane so in this case there's no subject in particular there's just sort of quite angular shapes and the the contrast the sort of starkness of the high exposures are you know set against the black but there's not much in between there's not many grays in between if that makes sense it's very they're very highly exposed but that in itself is just an aesthetic sometimes photographs are just there to look nice or interesting there's no story to be told as such uh, and it might not be your favorite style but it's, it's a distinctive style in itself and that's something that a lot of photographers can't achieve to be honest so it's yeah it's praiseworthy enough just to have a distinctive aesthetic yeah, sometimes uh, with some photographs, it's you need a kind of a story. Uh, I mean, they're quite powerful. This is quite a powerful image, but I feel like if you know the backstory behind this image, you might uh, have even more of a stronger response, perhaps, or a stronger feeling from it. Does anyone know why? Obviously, this is Churchill. Hopefully, you know. But he's kind of glaring at the camera. But does anyone know why he's glaring at the photographer in this particular case? Good thing Sophie isn't here because I told her this story. <laughs> but she uh, basically, this is obviously Churchill. He wasn't aware that he was going to have his photograph taken at first, but he kind of relented a bit and was like, okay, fine. And he ended up puffing on one of his infamous cigars. And the photographer is a very famous portrait photographer called Yusuf Kash. And he obviously didn't, you know, thought, well, there's smoke billowing everywhere. This is not ideal. It's not going to create the best image. And he asked very politely, can you please put your cigar out? And Churchill was like, oh, he just ignored him, didn't pay any attention. So what Karsh did is he went right up to him and he went, forgive me, sir. And he kind of took it right out of his mouth and just put it to one side. And then went back to his camera. And this is the first shot he basically took. And he said, he gave me such a belligerent look that he could have devoured me. And you can kind of see that. Like, it's almost a bit petulant. He's like, well, how dare you kind of thing. <laughs> but after a bit, uh, I think he became a bit more impressed by Karsh's sort of confidence and his assertiveness. He wasn't just being rude. He was just sort of being a bit more assertive as such, you know, dealing with the subject. And he said, you can probably make a roaring lion stand still to photograph him. So to this day, this photograph is sometimes archived as the roaring lion in Karsh's, uh, uh, Karsh's uh, collection of works. Does anyone recognize this man here? Yeah, they're, they're the same man, obviously. They might not believe it. So this man, this was taken, this is, he is Joseph Goebbels, who is, was the uh, Nazi uh, propaganda minister, I believe, in World War II. And this was taken on the same day, same person, probably within minutes of each other. You can see the massive difference in the expression. And the reason being is that the, um, he was suddenly made aware, uh, just before the second photo, that the photographer, Alfred Eisenstadt, and you probably guess from the name, was Jewish. So you can see there's completely two different expressions are here. The first is joyful, almost a bit cheeky, sort of laughter, you know, just like any person, you know, any person's uh, <laughs> capable of joy and laughter, aren't they? So, but the second expression is like palpable hatred just coming out of his eyes uh, towards the photographer. Uh, photographs can also be used to raise awareness of atrocities happening around the world that we would be clueless uh, without them. So this is a mother in Japan uh, who's bathing her daughter. Her daughter, you can see, is suffering from some severe deformities. Uh, she's suffering from something called Minamata disease. And that's so called because in the Minamata region of Japan, in the sort of late 1960s, early 1970s, there was a chemical factory that was releasing methyl mercury into the industrial wastewater. Um, and that led to the birth of many infants and children. You know, in this case, uh, she's, I can't remember how old she is here, maybe 10 years old. Um, with deformities and the photographer W. Eugene Smith he luckily he was able to release this but he was actually physically attacked by there's two stories I've heard either employees of the chemical plant or Yakuza gangsters employed by the chemical plant because they didn't want this issue to be spread around the world they didn't want anyone to be made aware of it but luckily this was released and brought to the world's attention um, of the plight of the sufferers of Minamata disease and sometimes photographs don't have to be used in isolation. They can be used 
in combination as like a part of a photo essay. So this was part of many photos and uh, pages that were published in Life magazine uh, many decades ago about to sort of document the struggles of a couple suffering from heroin addiction. So photography can also kind of be used to bring these sort of grisly, sort of underground niche areas of society and what might be horrors to some people into sort of your mainstream consciousness. You can, you know, this has been published in Life magazine, it's been put into your coffee table in your living room. So yeah, photography can achieve quite a lot of uh, monumental things that raise awareness to many subjects. Uh, this is a portrait um, by someone called Richard Abaddon. I don't know if any of you heard of him. He's one of my favourite portrait artists ever, essentially. He uh, was mostly famous for his fashion, um, sort of commercial photography, many decades ago. I think he's from New York, if I'm not wrong. But he also did a project in the uh, sort of countryside Midwest. And uh, hopefully I can open it. He went out west to recuperate and discovered his next major project. It took him five years. A sweeping chronicle of a part of America he had never photographed before. Drifters, loners, ordinary working people. Critics loved it or hated it. He was praised for his tough, unrelenting vision and at the same time was charged with exploiting his subjects and falsifying the West. The book was called In the American West, which really set off an enormous hostile response to the book. What was an East Coast successful photographer doing photographing working class people in the West? Was this really the West? And what was he doing? In the summer of 1994, Richard Avedon returned with this film crew to revisit some of the sitters. He encountered difficult questions and some startling responses. For Billy Mudd, Avedon's portrait broke a lifetime of isolation. I've been in the depressed stage and the loneliness so much that I've even went as far as checking out of this world. Got tired of it and just shot myself. He had been living a dangerous life, hauling dynamite. Disconnected, lonely, away from home for long periods of time. It's dark with your eyes. The pale eyes. When Billy Mudd first saw his portrait, it was hanging outside the Eamon Carter Museum. When he looked up, there he was, ten feet tall. Like an out-of-body experience. And it terrified me because I seen myself looking at myself and no way that a mirror could ever capture it or a photograph of, off a little Polaroid camera. Now. Because it's small. This blowed up to where I was looking at myself. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was dead. I actually experienced myself capturing myself and saying, you better change your life, son. This is the way it is. And it was a transforming experience. Billy changed his job and returned to his family. So yeah, so that's all I wanted to show you for now. <laughs> The rest of the film is about an hour and a half, so. Uh, so basically I wanted to show you that because um, I think, I don't know if you caught what Avedon said at that, just now when he was sitting in that cafe, he said, you know, it all starts with your eyes. And I think that's very true of most, a lot of photographs that involve people or even any living thing, even animals. And they don't necessarily have to be looking straight at you, obviously, even if they're looking off, pondering into the distance like the actress, there's still something, a lot of things can be expressed through the eyes and they say the eyes are the window to the soul, right? And there's a reason for that, so. He was saying, I mean, even with the, what we saw with Churchill earlier, you know, that look of how dare you, you know, it all comes straight out of your eyes. And Joseph Goebbels with that hatred for them, you know, just because that photographer was Jewish, he just, you know, that hatred is like almost beaming out of his eyes at him, like almost burning into that photographer. So, yeah, the eyes are very important. And here, I love this, uh, this uh, particular portrait because it's quite haunting, I find. It's very, I find it fascinating. I get kind of like goosebumps when I see it or when I hear that description just now because he's a very, his eyes are very unusually light coloured. And after you could look at it, first, I guess the eyes probably capture you first in most instances. And then as you kind of look to the rest of him, you think about it, the rest of him, it's just very unusual. His hairline is quite high, his like his neck is quite thick compared to his, you know, his narrow sort of face, and then he's got very lopsided shoulders. <laughs> his whole stance and his you know his hips, it's all very contorted almost, and that's probably just how he stands, that's how he's comfortable. But it's all very unusual, you, and the more you look at it, the more you kind of discover. But yeah, so the eyes are very important uh, in portrait photography. Uh, I think in particular, that's where it shows. Um, 
And Richard Avedon, the, the woman with the snake at the beginning, was also another one by Avedon, by the way. But yeah, sometimes photographs don't have to be of something really important, like important people, significant events. Sometimes it can be in mundane, everyday life. So these two, they're taken by Vivian Meyer. Um, you know, a lot of people would have passed these things and probably not taken any notice and just like, you know, just got on with their everyday lives. But she not only saw them, but she also took her own unique perspective on them and made them visually pleasing. I urge you all of you to kind of do the same, really. It doesn't have to be, you know, some important Churchill-like figure. Uh, it could be anything that's made to be uh, poignant. And that kind of leads me to this quote that I kind of stole from another talk, but uh, I thought was really cool uh, to describe the relationship between the photographer and what they're taking photos of. So I'll just leave you a few seconds to read that. Hopefully all of you read that. I don't know. I'm a fast reader, but I don't know. Hopefully you guys have had time to read that. But basically, I, I think it's quite a good description of like how we're not, as a photographer, we're not just passive. We can be passive observers, but we don't have to be. We can interact with our subject. Because I feel like if you had 10 different photographers taking a photo of exactly the same thing, even from the same sort of position, if you like, from the same, if you put a cross on the, on the floor, if they all were to stand in the same place, they all hopefully would have 10 very different compositions, I, I, I think, anyway. Because everyone's got a different personality, different character, different sense of art, artisticness, different artistic sense, I mean. So, in other words, it's not just, you know, we're not just passively observing, we can actually interact with our subject and there's a back and forth. So that kind of leads me to the composition part of the talk. Uh, and to me, composition is about what draws your eye in that photo and how do you hold the attention of the viewer and how, that, how does that attention sort of evolve as you move around that picture? Um, it's also very much about aesthetics. It's about what looks comfortable to the eye. You try and make it look comfortable and without distractions, um, and yet not too cluttered and so on, unless that is your aim. But you have to do it in a way that makes sense. That's what I feel anyway. So in this photo, for example, what would you say your eye is first drawn to? Any volunteers? Anybody? Yeah. I don't know, in most cases I would have thought, well, maybe it's not a very clear picture, so that doesn't help. If it was clear, probably your eye might be drawn maybe to the cyclist or something first, maybe. And where does your eye go? It probably goes round this sort of spiral staircase, which is kind of written in this diagram. I know it looks very scientific, but I mean, you don't have to think about this as you're composing all the time, but it's just a very, it will become natural to you. But yeah, it's all about what draws your eye first and then how it takes you, how it takes you on a sort of story or a journey to the rest of the photo, I think. So there's some very obvious sort of photographic tools that you can use, that sort of nice way of taking nicer photos or um, creating movement in your photos. Uh, so you can learn these, but obviously once you learn them, you can forget them all and try to play around with it. So in this case, what is the most obvious, probably one of the most obvious compositional tools? What does, it, does anyone know what the name of this might be? And uh, including committee members. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, leading lines. <laughs> Yeah, so leading lines, or sometimes it's called vanishing points as well. Uh, so yeah, what's very popular and what an effective tool is to use lines or shadows even, because they naturally have, make a nice way of directing the eye towards the direction. So on the right-hand side, for example, we got the, color, the railroad photo. Well, it's not very clear. But it's going into the, the railroad tracks are going off into the distance. And the one on the left, which I took in Hong Kong, is you know leading lines going off in a diagonal. So, But there's two different ways they're being achieved. So you see the one on the right, there's no obvious subject, it's only the railroad tracks, isn't it, going off. And the depth of field is a lot wider, so in other words, everything seems to be in focus, because that's a landscape, isn't it? That's what you usually do for a landscape. Whereas on the left, there is a subject, there's a person on the bench, he's looking at, looking at his watch, there's some shoes on the ground. So because of that, I use a shallower depth of field, because you, I was trying to draw your attention to that man. And what's in the distance is another man on the bench, he's not doing anything particularly interesting. And there's sort of, you know, trees in the background, but they're not adding anything to my photo. So I'm blurring that out for partly for aesthetic, but also because if I didn't, there'll be a distraction and it would make a bit of a messy photo. It wouldn't be very clear what I was trying to do with it. So that's a bit cleaner, I think, to you have to think about not just leading lines, but also what I want to include and exclude, essentially. 
And sometimes the lines are not always you know, straight going off into the distance. They can be spiral, like we saw with the bike. They can be like a curve or a spiral. And the tendency, the, how do you say, the best way, it's typically, you say, to express the, those curved lines is to have the end of the curve anchored into the corner of the photo, typically. It tends to be a bit more pleasing to the eye than if you were to anchor it, say, in the centre of, like, the side of the frame, if that makes sense. So it, it tends to be better to anchor a spiral, say if you had a spiral staircase, to have it finish in the corner, typically. Um, so that's kind of what I've done here, in a way. I could have done it a bit more. If I stepped back a bit, I could have maybe achieved that even more. But then I might have lost the sense of scale that that woman going down the stairs gives me. So it's kind of swings and roundabouts. There's no sort of hard and fast rule. You just have to look at the context of where you are. And obviously, sometimes you have to act fast anyway. So yeah, it's just what works with the photo. And yeah, sometimes leading lines can be, you know, made in other unobvious ways. And like these, I think this is in a prison canteen, I believe. And they're all those little things on the table. I think they're metal cups or something. All those lines, they're made, this photo is made interesting because the lines are broken up by the man in the middle. You're kind of looking up and down, you think, what's he doing there? And the lines also give a sense of scale as well, as well as the man in the middle. And sometimes uh, movement in a photo is not, uh, not created by obvious lines as such, but there's still movement created by the way the subject interacts with the rest of the photo. So on the left you see the guys are speaking, he's facing into the frame. And your attention will probably look at him first, but then it might go to the right, You're looking at the people in the audience. Maybe your eye travels up a bit, looks at the people in the stands, and you kind of slowly realise a sense of scale. This is larger than you might originally have thought. There's a lot of people, a lot of people in there. So if you had put him in the middle, or if you had, you know, it would, it would, you'd probably lose that sense of scale. And if you had kind of gone, shot it from behind with him in the middle, that might also be an effective shot, potentially. But again, there's a very different feeling. And typically, if you have a subject on the side of the frame, again, generally speaking, it's generally pleasing, more pleasing to the eye for them to be looking into the frame because it, it makes your eyes sort of lead naturally from one side to the other. But again, sometimes walls are made to be broken, aren't they? So this is a shot I took in a wet market in Hong Kong of a butcher, and he's obviously facing out of the frame, and he's just he's taking a rest, he's taking a break, so he's not he's sort of pondering, not doing anything in particular. Uh, I remember I submitted this to a student, like a really casual student competition in Bristol when I did my undergrad in Bristol. And I remember a lot of the judges really liked the food, I think the theme was food or something. Um, so this was quite stark and different compared to a lot of the other entries because it's like right there in your face. But there are a lot of people, a lot of the judges liked it, but I distinctly remember one saying, I think it would have been better if the guy was looking into the frame. And I remember another judge disagreed with him, he was like, oh, I, I think it's alright, I think it's kind of... So it's kind of, it's, well, it's all subjective, I, I can't say he's right or wrong, but my take on it is that if he were facing into the frame, I think he would have had to be doing something a lot more interesting for it to be an interesting photo. Because if you were just simply looking into the frame, you know, his expression is lost, you can't see it. So if you were like looking into the frame, if you were say standing on his hips or he was raising a meat cleaver and chopping or something, that would be a more interesting movement, I, I think, if I were to do that. But if not, then so that's more of a content issue rather than a composition issue. So if he's facing out of the frame, I, think it, I still think it kind of works, it's a bit more, it's a bit different. But um, Another thing is I want to illustrate with this photo is that it might also be good to not have too many things overlapping each other. So, for example, he is not he's not obscuring the meat. For example, he's to one side of it, and that can be an effective way of sort of making it less cluttered. You're kind of giving it space. You could, for example, if I went to the right of it um, and took it head on, straight on, that's a completely different photo, and that might be effective in a, in a different way. But yeah, sometimes taking something at diagonal. Um, which you might see me do more of in future slides, kind of creates a nice corner to me and makes it slightly comfortable. And sometimes this photo doesn't have to have a subject at all, as I showed you with the black and white photos of the caravans. This is Andreas Gursky. He's quite distinctively, his, this is, his style is very distinctive in that he does a lot of large scale, you know, a lot of things, a lot of objects in it, but sometimes it's usually quite ordered or chaotically ordered. And in this case, it's, like I said, there's nothing in particular for you to look at, but there's it, it an aesthetic there. It's all parallel, so parallel, all these parallel lines leading to one, nothing in particular, but you still can't help but look at it. Um, and it's not my, I can't say it's my favourite style, I'm sure it's kind of one of those things you love or hate, but I appreciate it. it's his own distinctive style that he's developed and he's very good at. So, so this is one of the second or uh, most obvious composition at all. 
I think I'm iterating here. Anyone guess what it might be? Anyone? Maybe I'm not iterating as effectively as I could. <laughs> Anyone heard of the rule of thirds? So it's the, I, I, again, it could be illustrated better. This is just a couple of examples I found of why I did the rule of thirds, meaning you place the subject or the thing of interest one third into the frame, either left or right or top or bottom. And it's very commonly used, it's very popular because, again, it creates a nice sense of like your eyes drawn to that thing and you can easily move to the rest of the photo. Uh, but it doesn't always work in every case. Obviously, in some cases, you might want to put something dead in the middle and that's what works for that. But So rule of thirds is not for everything, but it's just an easy way to uh, compose uh, something. And again, with the woman at the wet market, I've given them this whole diagonal thing where I've put a, sort of made a corner happen. So yeah. And uh, this one is again kind of rule of thirds. I'm not really sure if it is or not, because the, there's two women in the middle, and you can kind of use tricks like this the smoke is obscuring the woman on the left. So that woman on the right is kind of now in the third. So you could, could say, is it rule of thirds? Maybe. But again, I haven't taken this dead on, I've taken it at an angle, so there's more sort of geometry involved, there's a bit more layering involved. So again, just look around and try and think of different ways to compose. Of course, sometimes putting things dead in the centre is appropriate because it offers symmetry and rule of thirds would not work in any of these cases probably, most likely. Um, so this man on the right, he's diving into a swimming pool or something and he's got a base of these people cheering him on that forms like a little base. The woman in the middle is a belly dancer and the one on the left is basketball players and the people jumping up, they kind of direct you towards the middle, don't they? The, your movement, your eye moves to the middle. So yeah, rule of thirds probably wouldn't work in these cases. And sometimes there's neither rule of thirds nor um, centre, putting things in the centre. This, I would say this is neither, I would say this is kind of off-centre. But it works, I think. And another thing I want to point out with this is that it's great because the lamp, the lamp post is not behind the, the boys, if that makes sense. If those boys were in front of that lamppost, it would, again, be slightly messy and not quite as pleasing to the eye, I think, anyway. So it works really well. Uh, yeah. And also, if you look around you, um, sometimes you can find fra natural frames in you know, your surroundings. So use that to your advantage. Sometimes it creates a nice effect. And it doesn't have to be like the frogs in the middle. There are frogs in the, also in the wet market in a little cage. You know, I didn't frame that perfectly, but you know, I didn't, didn't think it needed to. It kind of creates its own imperfection, really. Sometimes imperfection can be a nice touch. So I want to use this photo just to illustrate um, use of space and sort of thinking about composition a bit. Um, this is quite an average street shot I took in Japan. I, it was really cool because people wandering around wearing like traditional yukata and kimonos, and I really wanted to take photos of them more closely. Sometimes I was a bit shy because you know, all photographers I think have an element of shyness to them. Um, and maybe I was feeling shy, or I thought if I went too close, they would change their positions and look at me, and I, I'd lose this what I've got here. But I could have done it better. I definitely could have done it better. And what I did was, and I don't advise you to do this every time. You should compose everything in camera, not afterwards on the computer as much as possible, because that's where you get the best results. But what I did was, in this case, I thought, I'm going to get rid of all this useless space. And I've done this, which I'm not saying everyone will agree with, but I took, got rid of the space on the right, which is all that metal doors, because they're not really doing anything for me anyway. I got rid of their faces, most of their faces, and I got rid of their feet. And what I hopefully achieved is that you are eyes is drawn to the yellow ribbon on her yukata, I think it is. Uh, and then, you know, you look at the fabric, you know, on their, both of their clothes, and you also hopefully see the contrast of their traditional clothing with the guy wearing contemporary sort of t-shirt, jeans and trousers coming towards us. So it's kind of, I'm sort of narrowing in on what I think is important and getting rid of the rest, essentially, and using the space a bit better, hopefully. Yeah, I showed you previously portrait photos, and portrait photos... Obviously, they're a great way of showing you what a person is. They look right into the camera, they, or their feelings come across. But sometimes you might want to think about other ways to do this, like looking at a person's surroundings, maybe their working environment. So this guy on the piano is Leonard Bernstein. He's quite a famous composer and conductor. I think he wrote West Side Story, if I'm not wrong. Um, but yeah, his working environment is not fancy at all. It's not glamorous. It's very almost a little bit cluttered, very casual, down to earth. He's wearing sandals, if you can maybe see, wearing sandals. So. Yeah, this tells you a lot about who he is as a person, perhaps in a different way to just him looking dead on at the camera. So it's just something else to think about. This is like the desk of, I think, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt. I think it was the day he died, actually. This is the Oval Office. 
And again, even without a person there, having a photo of just what they own can tell you a bit about them as well. He's got lots of trinkets, like cartoon sort of figurines on his desk, which is kind of, you might not expect for a president of a country, but it's kind of, you know, quite quirky in a way. But in, obviously right in front of him, uh, which you can't miss, is his maiden responsibility, which is the map of you know, America, which is unusually in the centre, but maybe not surprising. <laughs> And this is a kitchen of uh, President Truman, I think it was. So, again, there's no one there, but it kind of shows maybe how down to earth he is, you know, how un unglamorous his surroundings are at home, even though he's the leader of a country. It's like quite. And I always found it really amazing how he managed to make all the furniture match to the doors and <laughs> the cupboards and everything. That's quite. It almost looks like a showroom. It's almost like it's not really been used, but yeah, each to their own. Yeah, so what, um, sometimes you can take photos of objects as well. I, don't, I usually like photos of people. Um, but when you take photos of inanimate objects, sometimes I think, I, I, I let my imagination run wild. I sort of anthropomorphize objects sometimes, I think. So if you take photos of it, objects, maybe they almost become like their own characters. They become their own kind of, they become like people to me. Or secondly, what you might think is with the absence of people, you kind of focus on the function of those objects. Like if people were there, you wouldn't notice those objects at all. But without them, you kind of think you kind of think about the basic function that those things serve that they that we make them to serve humankind, if you like. So that can be another thing to think about. Or the subject could be right there in your face, um, you know, aggressively in the center in the center of your attention. Does anyone know who took these photos? Quite distinctive style. Anybody? No? There's a guy called Bruce. Oh. Yeah, Bruce Gilden. I always remember Bruce because it's like I feel like that's quite an aggressive sounding name. <laughs> I never remember Gilden. I usually never remember Gilden, but anyway. I think he's from New York, if I'm not wrong. But he his style is to it's very infamous. He kind of literally goes up to complete strangers with a camera and a flash and just goes boom and then just walks off and not doesn't say a word and you know, can be like I say, you either love it or hate it. I think um there's certainly a very aggressive style. Uh, and I think, again, you don't, we don't have to be passive observers. I'm not saying we have to do this, but you can be passive observers or we can kind of take a bit more control and be a bit more assertive and not manipulate, but sort of, you know, interact with our environment a bit more. And I don't think it's because it's a personality thing. I think, because I think a lot of photographers are naturally quite shy people. And it's a cliche that they kind of use the camera as like a shield to help them interact with, the, it's like a tool to help them interact with the world in a way. So don't feel that, okay, you're a shy person, like I have to do a certain kind of photography, that's you know, distant, try and, you know, uh, break boundaries a bit and get, explore outside your comfort zone and you might like the result you get. Oh yeah, also, if you feel subconscious, because sometimes I find if I put a camera in front of my face, people look at me straight away and that kind of makes me think, okay, you know, I can't get candid expressions anymore. So one, two tricks you can do is, one that I've heard of, I don't think I've tried it very much yet, but I always keep telling people about it. You bring the camera up to your face and then people look at you and then you drop it down a little bit, and then as if you're not going to take a photo, and then they kind of relax and they think, oh, he's not, they're not going to do anything, and then and then you snap. <laughs> so that can be a trick that you can use apparently to get more candid um, and relaxed express natural expressions. Another thing you can do, which I kind of try to do here, I'm not sure if it, you know, I'm not saying the perfect photo, I kind of like it, is shooting from the hip, and that obviously takes a lot of trial and error. <laughs> um, I don't know if you, you might be able to practice it. I suppose I just do it sometimes when I feel like it, but. Again, it offers a very different perspective. You know, you're know, you doing like several feet down, aren't you? So it gives a completely different angle and your subjects will again have more natural sort of uh, expressions. But it can have that spontaneity to it because the angle is going to be very weird. You're probably going to have very strange compositions because you don't have no idea what you're taking a photo of. So that in itself can be quite cool. So yeah, lastly, I just want to say, uh, photography is a lot about observation and trial and error and I think the best thing you can do is just look everywhere. Don't just look straight ahead of you, look up, look down. Uh, take every opportunity you can to take unusual photos. So this one, for example, was taken in, I took in Japan. It was on a boat, uh, and what they do is quite weird. It's kind of a tourist thing. They give you prawn crackers, and you hold them up in the air, because these seagulls and these hawks, which have, the hawks you can't see here, but they're hawks that follow the boat, like massive you know, numbers of them, and you have to kind of try not to get pooped on. But uh, what I was doing was I literally went, directly up like this and took it. And it looks surreal. I've heard people say it doesn't look like a real photograph. It looks like I've photoshopped birds onto a blue sky and it definitely isn't. It's completely real, <laughs> I assure you. Um, but yeah, so just look everywhere, try everything. This one was taken from a coach. It was literally a tour bus coach. Um, but I really liked it because the colors are just so, I love those kind of vibrant 
colours like this greeny sort of and this red. And also that cute pig, because um I'm Chinese and um it's in my blood to be drawn towards cute things, so I was like, oh that's really cool. And then I took a photo of it. But yeah, so it doesn't have to be like you don't have to be in an obvious sort of stance or an obvious place, you can just take it from anywhere. I took it from a bus. And it looks a bit unusual and yeah, but I just really like the colours. I think it works. Um yeah, and hidden moments I think are one of my favourites as well. So this is again going back to just keep looking everywhere. Like don't just look for the obvious, oh this is going on, really, you know, people posing over there. You know, look for things that you know people wouldn't other people might not see. This was taken at Cambridge University Polo Club, like an annual ball. And it was a very grand dinner, and you know, I was looking around and this I don't even know if they're a couple, maybe they're just friends, who knows? But it looked sort of very flirtatious and sort of seductive and cheeky. And yeah, I thought it was a really, you know, hidden, again, a hidden sort of stolen moment. So uh, look everywhere for these opportunities. So finally, I want to go into some tips and uh, forgive me for any cheesy sort of uh, quips that you might see here. But uh, first is don't hesitate. So act fast, you know, don't, because, you know, these things happen in a split of a second. And the more you wait, that image is going to be gone forever. So don't hesitate. Uh, be brave. And by that, I mean, you know, it's very easy to be self-conscious. If you've got a camera in your hands, people are looking at you and they might be like frowning and be like, what the hell, what is she doing? Or who are you doing? Um, so, but then when you think of, obviously, as long as you're not being aggressive and, and within reason, uh, take it because chances are you won't see them again, firstly, and you'll have something that is with you forever. So, and hopefully you should be happy with it. So again, within reason, without being impolite, uh, yeah, go ahead and do it. Try and try again. So this, I think this is mostly for beginners, I would say, because, and I say within reason, I'll explain why, because once you've taken a photo, say you think, okay, this looks really good, I've taken it straight on or diagonal, try different ways. Like, if you, don't just take it straight on. Try, okay, from the left, try from the right, you know, try you know, up and down, try going closer. Uh, and I say within reason because, you know, you don't want to be, obviously with digital cameras, you can take thousands and millions of photos within a few seconds and you've got so much storage, so it doesn't matter. With film cameras, you're a bit more limited, so you have to kind of compose carefully. But don't be, don't just do it because you can. Don't be lazy with your, you know, just because I can take a thousand photos and, you know, at a time, I'll keep doing it. I think maximum three to five, and I'm being generous with that. <laughs> you know, if you, if you see something, if, obviously for something that's usually stationary, otherwise it would have moved on by then. You know, take it within sort of three to five shots, and if you haven't got it by then, it probably won't ever happen. Uh, it's probably not the, the day for it. Um, so move on. But uh, as you go on, you will probably do it in less, fewer, fewer tries. Um, so don't, yeah, just experiment, essentially, is what I was trying to say. Oh, this is a long order, but never mind. Uh, so the next thing is aesthetics is the key. So to me, composition is about making something look, I wouldn't say good, maybe presentable is the right word. So have a clear goal. If you have a subject, think about how are you trying to present it to people? How am I trying to highlight this without distractions, without you know anything else? Uh, or if there's no clear subject, just think about how you're trying to present it. You know, Is it in, a, in an artistic, clear cut way? Get rid of anything that causes distraction. So if there's a traffic light in the background, if there's an exit sign, you might want to, you know, not you might want to crop it out later or not include it at all, or use a shallow depth of field so you kind of blur it out. Because you don't want anything that's that's just going to be messy otherwise. Right? Use space well. So in other words, don't have too much negative space. Because if you have too much space, it can distract, it can make your photo less effective. And again, it's all about getting rid of distractions. At the same time, don't have things that are too close to the edge of the frame. So if Say if there's a frame is there and there's something that's like millimetres away from it or touching it almost, or even beyond it, that's very uncomfortable to look at. So think about using space effectively. Um, and ultimately think about, is this comfortable to look at? What would I change about it to make it more comfortable? How can I rearrange things to create a bit more uh, useful space? Question photos. So when you look at photos, think about what do you like about it and what you don't like about it. I put this here, colour versus black and white, because... To me, I like, I like both very much, but I think there's a tendency for a lot of people, whether they're beginners or otherwise, to automatically go for black and white because I think, okay, if I make it black and white, it's automatically classy and cool and edgy, you know, it's artistic. And that can obviously work in many cases, but think about it a bit more carefully. Don't be, again, don't be lazy and rely on one style or another. I think colour, you know, they both offer things that the other doesn't. So colour can offer, you know, a lovely dynamic range, you know, uh, a lot of textures and emotions even 
that won't be possible with black and white. So say that picture of the, the cartoon pig on the truck with the green and the red, that wouldn't have been effective in black and white, I don't think, anyway, or as effective. Um, well, I don't know, if you have a sunset or sunrise or twilight hour, golden hour, you know, can you capture those in black and white? I'm not sure. I don't know. Whereas black and white offers, obviously, minimalism, simplicity, you know, starkness, a kind of classiness to them, perhaps. So they both have their own pros and cons, but don't, you know, depend on one or the other. I think it's the best thing. Uh, oh, yeah, this is the wrong order, but yeah, don't move around. So as I mentioned before, don't be afraid to, don't just plant your feet in one place and then shoot a few shots and then don't move anywhere else and then go off. You know, move around, you know, go on your knees even, like kneel down, go closer. Don't rely on your zoom because if you zoom in on your subject compared to actually physically moving a few steps forward, it creates a completely different look. It's almost like the contents of your uh, field of view interact with each other a bit differently. So make the effort and uh, don't be afraid to take a few steps forward rather than just standing there and zooming in. So on to the more technical part of the talk, because I'm sure a lot of you are like, well, this is all well and good, but I don't know how to use a camera. What do all the buttons mean? So I'm going to go to a little bit about the technical side, just some very basics. Uh, sorry if you already all know all of this already, but uh, I think some of you might not. So I uh, hope you might learn a couple of things today. Um, I had to look up a lot of this until quite uh, fairly recently because I didn't really care too much about technical side. But basically the camera, obviously the light goes through the lens. There's an aperture, I don't know if I can point this out, point out. that grey sort of circle has got a hole in it, which is called the aperture. So all lenses have a different aperture range. They can, you know, make the hole smaller or bigger depending on the lens you've got, and I'll talk about that later. What I've shown here is what they call an SLR, or DSLR stands for digital SLR, SLR stands for single lens reflex, and all that means is that, is that there's a mirror that ref oh, sorry, reflects the light, it goes upwards into this prism at the top, and make sure that the light kind of goes into your viewfinder, so that's how you can see uh, what's, what, it's, what, you're, what your lens is looking at. When you press the shutter button, that mirror, the blue line, flips upwards, and the black line on the, on the left, just next to the red one, it, it, which is the shutter, that opens. And that allows the light to go through, uh, through the shutter and in, onto your sensor. So the sensor is like the equivalent of film, if you like. It's what receives the light and kind of uh, processes the image. So, so obviously this is a mirrored camera. So there are cameras that are mirrorless and there are pros and cons to each that I won't go into today because it's getting long enough over this. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's the basics of how, how a camera works. But the first setting that's probably most people know about is shutter speed. Uh, shutter speed, which is denoted as S, or in Canon cameras, is called TV mode. Uh, and all that is is literally how long does that shutter open and let in line. And it's measured in seconds, or fractions of a second. And as you can see from this diagram, obviously the longer that your um, lens is open, the uh, more light that's let in. But also, it kind of, obviously, the more time is let in, if that makes sense. So there's more movement that's captured. And that can create a blur, obviously, if you have very long shutter speed and fast movement going on. So you think to yourself, well, why would I want to increase my shutter speed? Because I don't want blur, hopefully, uh, unless you intentionally want blur. But uh, you, can lower, you can increase the shutter speed, uh, uh, in theory, in sort of dark situations. So if you don't have a lot of light, you can increase the shutter speed and that lets in more light. But obviously it's not ideal if you, have a lot of, if you don't want a lot of blur. So another setting is called aperture, which as I mentioned is the hole in your lens. So the aperture is, uh, how do you say, it's, it's denoted by the F numbers. So confusingly, the lower the F number, the bigger the hole will be. And the larger the F number, the smaller the hole will be. And so the smaller the F number, as you can see on the left-hand side of the diagram, it means you have a shallower depth of field. And that's illustrated by that photo on the left of the bottle caps. So the shallower depth of field means you have a certain area that's in focus and the rest is sort of blurry. And that can create a nice aesthetic depending on what you're shooting. So like tend to be portraits tend to be quite popular to have shallow depth of field and so on. Um, whereas if you have a larger F number, you have a wider depth of field, that means everything will be in focus. So it tends to be more popular for things like landscape, architecture, because you want more of that in focus. You don't want really any blurry areas typically. So as you might imagine, if you have a small F number and your aperture is large, that means more light's coming in. So that's another setting, like along with shutter speed, that you can use to control how much light's coming into your camera. And lastly is ISO, which uh, essentially, if you set the ISO, I think if I understand it correctly, it kind of brightens or darkens the photo. So 
regardless of what settings you've done for your shutter speed and aperture, if you like, regardless of the light that can't save you, they set your shutter speed to really quick, your aperture to really large, uh, small hole, and you chose a really high ISO number. So in other words, you have, don't have a lot of light coming in, but your ISO is high. That will forcibly, if you like, brighten your image for you. So you think to yourself, oh, why can't I just do your ISO then, you know, if I don't need to care about shutter speed, do I? But obviously, if you increase the ISO, you're forcibly making those dark points in your photo light, and that can create a lot of noise uh, or grain. Uh, and that, especially digital photography, it can create a you know, horrible sort of sheen on your photo, so you don't really want that. So don't rely only on ISO. You have to kind of uh, balance it with this triangle of ISO, shutter speed, and aperture, typically, to control how much light is coming in and... Uh, your ISO can kind of determine what shutter speed you can use as well. So if you have a high ISO, you might think, okay, I might not need to use as long a shutter speed, but you have to really balance it carefully to create nice photos. So uh, you have different modes on your camera. So shutter, uh, S or TV mode is shutter priority, meaning you can adjust your shutter speed and your camera will calculate your aperture for you, if you like. And aperture priority means it's the opposite. You set your aperture and your camera kind of calculates the appropriate shutter speed. Uh, as you get more uh, advanced, you can use other modes. So I, haven't, I, think, I think I've ever used program mode. I'm just telling you here what it means in case people are wondering. You can select the ISO and then your camera calculates the shutter speed and aperture, if, that, if that's correct. Uh, manual mode means you can have total control, essentially. You control every shutter speed, aperture, and ISO um, independently of each other. So I think as you get more experience, I would say obviously avoid all the other uh, preset modes because um, they're not really going to do anything. You have no control whatsoever. If you're starting off, maybe try a shutter or aperture priority just to kind of get the hang of what that means and sort of get the feel of, you know, what does the shutter speed, what will that give me in this particular um, uh, light source? And as you get more experience, you can kind of get more and more towards manual mode maybe. The only downside, I guess, to manual mode is it might... Be a bit inconvenient because you're taking a lot of time to do these settings. If your light is changing a lot, it can be maybe a bit cumbersome, perhaps if you're inexperienced, especially. So yeah, but just basically just try a few things out. Don't avoid the presets. Is basically the point of this. Uh, white balance, in case anyone's wondering, uh, basically just means color temperature. Um, so sometimes different hues of light, you know, especially artificial light, can give different hues to your photo. So it can be color temperature, literally cold, like blue, or warm, which is orange. So like, I think tungsten and artificial lights might give more of a blue hue to your photos, which you might not want. Um, also, you have to look at the room around you. Like this room, for example, has got a lot of browns and greens and reds in it. So, I mean, photos I remember taking the other week were a lot very green, so I had to kind of compensate for that um, in post. But you can use presets in your camera, which are shown on the right, uh, which kind of can be quite effective to, to sort of balance that out. So if a room is too warm, you can kind of put more bluish tones in there and it comes out more a bit more balanced or at least representing reality more accurately. You can use something called custom uh, white balance, which means that you take a photo of something that's kind of white, like paper or a piece of card, and you can set the custom white balance to that. But um, yeah, so you can do that if you want to as well. So I think a lot of you might have seen, maybe might have seen the screen like this and think on your camera, wondering what the hell that all means. So uh, N basically means it's on manual mode in this particular instance. The 15, I can't really point this out, but the 15 uh, in quotation marks means 15 seconds, so that's your shutter speed. F16 is your aperture, ISO is what you set your ISO to. You've got AWB in near the middle, which is just, they set it to automatic white balance. Uh, so yeah, I think there's, there's also, I can't really point things out, so it's a bit difficult, but <laughs> yeah, at the bottom you've obviously got your battery life and like how many photos you can take and so on. But that basically is just telling you all your settings. And some cameras are quite fancy and they've got like a screen on the top. That basically gives the same information. Um, it's just an easy way to look at it. So uh, focal length essentially is just the zoom of your lens. Uh, so the lower the the lower the focal length, like here you've got 24 is the lowest shown here, or they can go lower, just means wide angle. So you have more, you can include more of your surroundings in the photo. And uh, the higher the focal length, the more zoomed in you are essentially. So it can go verge towards tele what they call telephoto. So the more wide angle uh, focal lengths that tend to be used for more for like landscapes, architecture, that sort of thing. And the middle, sort of 35, 50, 70, tend to be more used for like portraiture. That's the uh, popular usage of them. And as you get more into telephoto, obviously you can go higher than 135. 
where you zoom in and like you can use more for sort of sports, nature photography, that sort of thing. But that's just generally speaking. So you have to be sometimes a bit wary of focal length because especially with wide angle, it can cause distortions. So you can see here, it creates a lot of, um, the lines are quite curved, which is not what would really happen. In, you know, that's not what your eye sees. But of course it can create a, you know, interesting effect that might be desirable to you. So, you know, just, but just watch out for it because especially with portraits, you have to carefully choose it because people would, people want when they have their photos taken of them they want to look good at the end of the day they want to have photos that are flattering you can see the wide angle lens 17 and um, it doesn't you know the, her face is kind of been distorted and it doesn't look quite like you know reality so a more flattering focal length you might want to use is you know 35 50 70 or something so always take into account what makes the person look good if you are taking portraits and use the appropriate focal length uh, yeah, sense, people might want to know about sensor sizes because I was a bit confused about it um, before. I didn't know what it really meant, but basically, sensor, you know, the bigger the sensor, uh, the sort of better the resolution of your photos. But of course, cameras with bigger sensors will be more expensive, as you might expect. So you might get cheaper sort of cropped sensors like that APS-C, the green one, which you know literally crops your photo. Um, so you get less resolution, but you know it might be more affordable. So it's good to learn on say smaller sensors if you can afford it. And then maybe later as you get more experience and you can save up, you can get like more full frame, large frame, or it's like medium format, large format. Uh, yeah, so this is all a lot of like detail which you don't need to remember, but all I want to say here is that, you know, these different sensor sizes, you can see the devices that they might be used in at the bottom. So you go from like full frame, uh, crop frame, you know, point and shoot, you know, compact cameras, your phone. Uh, that's what the sensor size is, you know, reflective of quality and type of device. And it also it, um, enforces something called the crop factor, which you don't need to worry about too much. And again, please don't remember any of this because <laughs> I'm sure most people won't care about it. But uh, basically all it means is that the focal length, aperture and ISO of one uh, particular sensor size will not be the same on another. That's all you need to know, basically. So in case people are wondering about that. Uh, so yeah, to finish off with, um, we've got some recommendations if you want to learn some more after this talk. Uh, so there's some books I'd highly recommend, and the photos are shown here. You can see, I think you can get them all on Amazon. So the one at the bottom right, how to photograph absolutely everything, I think it's quite useful for beginners because it, it literally takes any situation that you can think of and gives you tips on how to like, what settings to use, even if it's like animals, landscapes, water, babies, you know, food, whatever. So it's pretty useful. Um, these two here, I've taken a lot of photos from these other two, the life photographers and the 20th century, because I really like them in terms of composition. They're, a lot of the photos are taken sort of mid 20th century, so a lot of film photography, you know, things were not perfectly in focus, so it was a little bit blurry and, you know, a little bit fuzzy, but they were just really amazing photos because they were just telling stories, and I think that's what photography is all about. The video I showed you earlier, which was Richard Avedon, Darkness and Light, is about an hour and a half. But it's one of my favourites, it's an amazing documentary, I highly recommend all of you to watch it, even if you're not a portrait or fashion photographer, it's just really, really cool, the way he talked, the way they discuss it, his work. Uh, Alejandro suggested Alex Soth's YouTube channel, and I think he talks about like a wide breadth of topics, um, so it's really uh, quite interesting. Uh, also, have, keep a look out for any exhibits in museums, especially in London, uh, especially like awards, they might show the winners, like the, the compet uh, com competition winners and runner-ups, because um, that's quite a nice day out. You can kind of go to a gallery uh, and kind of get inspired. Uh, a website I would recommend is something called Fotsy, which is quite, like, it's got so many resources on it, like basics about techniques and stuff. So I highly recommend that as well as a basic learning uh, platform. Yeah, so finally, after all that, to go and to introduce what we do. So we hope to kind of create a nice community of like-minded photographers. Uh, and to do so, we hope to... Uh, hold more talks and workshops by ourselves, maybe something, some more educational ones from now on, if you're interested. Um, so yeah, and also guests, we have a lineup of guest speakers that are coming up. So they're all professional photographers talking about their work, uh, how they got started, what their career is about, you know, might, why they might go from here. We also have more social events like photo walks and meetups. So photo walks are literally, we have, we plan a route for like, that probably take us for one or two hours. And we literally go on that route, take photos. So it's a great opportunity for like people to, you know, if they have, even if they've got a phone, they can come and attend. If they want to hire something for the day and, t and bring it along, they can ask, you know, how does this work? What do I do? How do I compose? That's a great opportunity for that because it's live and it's, you know, uh, we're walking and taking photos all the way. We also got meetups where we sit in like a cafe or pub 
you know, bring your equipment if you want, you know, if you want to ask how to use it, if you've got books, we'll certainly bring our own books as well if you want to look at them, uh, or your prints, laptops of your work, anything, just, you know, come along and have a chat, have a bite to eat, have a drink. We also hope to run more competitions. We've got one running, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, but uh, we really, uh, you know, want more involvement with this because if we do, that'll lead us on to some more really cool um, activities that we want to plan, which are firstly exhibitions and secondly a book or a zine. Because you know, if we want, we would love to be able to present the stuff that you give to us by displaying it or publishing it and having something that you can physically keep and hold. But obviously, we need you to contribute to that. So. Please do so. Uh, and also, in the, in the more distant future, we'd like to do more sort of trips, maybe either locally or, you know, in the COVID permits, maybe in the next year or so, maybe overseas even. Um, and lastly, quite uh, uh, quite in, quite excitingly, we hopefully are trying to get a, our first dark room ever set up, um, hopefully on St John's. Uh, but we yeah you know, watch the space for that because we are still working on it. But if we do, we'd like to hold like inductions to teach people how to develop film. And, you know, you can book the dark room once you've done that at like a minimal running cost. So that'd be really cool. How you can take part. So obviously you can join us. Uh, we are obviously a student society. We, you know, all volunteers. You know, we're not non-profit, obviously. So please uh, contribute in any way possible by attending our talks, becoming a member. All our events are free for members. I think only our talks and like our sort of guest speaker talks are charged. We will charge £5 for those. Any social activities are free to everybody. Uh, attend obviously and lastly probably most importantly engage with us because you know we have an F, uh, a Facebook discussion group which is quite devoid of photos unfortunately and quite sadly so please do share with us you know if you went away for a weekend took some snaps even if it's on your phone share it with us we're interested in this and or if you have a favorite photographer or favorite photo that you wish you'd taken share it with us or upcoming ones that we might not have heard of if there's any news, like new books, new exhibitions, tell us about it. If we have any feedback or suggestions on stuff you might want to see in the future, let us know. And yeah, that's it from us for now. So that's our beautiful committee, <laughs> some of whom are here today. And um, yeah, if you want to ask for help or information about anything, please do let us know. Uh, we're probably going to the pub after this. So if you have any questions, maybe catch us before we go or come with us. You're more than welcome. This code, QR code, uh, if you scan it, please take photos if you want to, um, leads to all of our social media, our mailing list, how to join, uh, contact details, everything. So it's all there if you want code. So, and that's it, I think. Thank you very much for coming and listening. <laughs>